أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما نافعا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the Reflections on the Risale in Nur by Bedu Zaman Sahid Nursi podcast series. This is Mustafa Tuna. You can listen to the episodes of the series wherever you listen to your podcasts or at the website www.reflections-rn.org. A rough translation of the text we will be reflecting upon is also posted at this website. You can go to uh, the uh, podcasts, then words, then the 13th word, and scroll down to the relevant section. Inshallah, as this also implies, we will continue reading and thinking about, reflecting upon the 13th word, which is, like the 12th word, a comparison of the wisdom of the Qur'an, the guidance that the Qur'an offers to our lives, and that of um, philosophies, worldviews, that have not been guided by revelation. In the past episode, we read Ustad Nursi's advice to prison inmates, how a Quranic perspective enlightens the lives of all human beings under all circumstances, including in prison inmates. The sick, the poor, the downtrodden, the wretched of the earth, whatever. A Quranic perspective enlightens illuminates life and puts joy into it regardless of the circumstances that one finds himself or herself for a true believer there is light and joy in everything because a true believer lives a life of connection to the creator and looks forward to meeting his lord inshallah in paradise um, so, in this episode, we will continue with another advice to the prison inmates and as well as the prison guards who are taking care of the prison inmates. And again, uh, this is partly because Ustad Nursi spent quite a large uh, part of his life, several years of his life, in prisons. And he had students around him and he had prison inmates around him. And as, as he always did throughout his life, he was teaching. So this was his teaching to them. However, we too can find a benefit and uh, and wisdom in this. And we will think about that. We will try to reflect upon how we can find benefit in this. But before we move on to uh, reading this section, I want us to, to um, remind ourselves about something that we read before in the 12th word, which was also a comparison of the, the wisdom of the Qur'an and worldviews or philosophies that are not guided by revelation. In there, in the uh, third foundation, he had four foundations there. In the third foundation, Ustad Nursi uh, wrote this. And inshallah, I'm just uh, going to read the, the English without uh, the Turkish because we already did this uh, lesson. Uh, inshallah, this is a reminder. The lessons that the Quranic wisdom and the wisdom of philosophy each offer about the social life of human beings. So this was about social life of human beings. As for the wisdom of philosophy, it accepts force as the point of reliance in social life. Its target is interest. It recognizes struggle as the normative principle of life. It takes factionalism and negative nationalism as the bond that holds communities together. Its fruit is to, to gratify the lower soul's vain desires and to increase humanity's needs. And thus, the characteristic of force is aggression. Since there isn't enough to fulfill every desire, 
the characteristic of interest is fighting over it. The characteristic of the principle of struggle is conflict. Because it is based on nourishing oneself by swallowing others, the characteristic of factionalism is aggression. So it is because of this wisdom that the humanity has lost felicity. As for the Quranic wisdom, it accepts rights to be its point of reliance as opposed to force. As purpose, it accepts virtue and divine pleasure as opposed to interest. It takes the principle of mutual assistance as opposed to the principle of struggle as the foundation of life. In bonding communities together, instead of factionalism and nationality, it accepts bonds of religion, class and country. Its purposes limit the transgressions of the vain desires of the lower soul, encourage the spirit toward noble ideals, satisfy its lofty emotions and, and, and directs human beings and it directs human beings toward the perfections of humanity. Now this is going to be the part that will be most relevant in this episode inshallah. The characteristic of rights is alliance, agreement. The characteristic of virtue is mutual reliance. The characteristic of the principle of mutual assistance is hastening to help one another in time of need. The characteristic of religion is solidarity and mutual attraction. The characteristic of reigning in and tethering the lower soul and urging and releasing the spirit free, releasing the spirit free is felicity in both worlds. The characteristic of rights is alliance. The characteristic of the virt of virtue is mutual reliance. The characteristic of the principle of mutual assistance is hastening to help one another in time of need. Finally, the characteristic of religion is solidarity and mutual attraction, mutual assistance. Right? These are the things that Ustad Nursi thinks should be defining the lives of believers who are guided by the Quran, regardless of where they are and who they are dealing with be it uh, students at a school, at a madrasa, uh, people that you see and interact at the marketplace, or the prison inmates, or in a prison, be it the relationship between the prison inmates, among the prison inmates, or between the prison guards and the prison inmates. These are all believers regardless of where they are, what they are doing, what they have done. They are all believers who deserve to be treated as God's worshipping slaves. And then at the next stage, you can also think of everybody as human beings, as slaves of God, regardless of where they stand in terms of their belief or disbelief. Because until the last moment comes and people submit their souls to their Lord, they can always change course and we do not know who is going to end successfully. It may be others and not us. It may be anybody regardless of where we see them right now. Umar radiallahu an, as we have mentioned before, was beloved to God as he was walking in the street toward the place where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in order to kill the Prophet ﷺ. He was a beloved of God as he was trying to kill the Prophet ﷺ. So with that, inshallah, we will move on to the relevant section or the section in the 13th word that we are reading and reflecting upon today. Bismihi subhanahu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In his name, glory be unto him. May peace and God's blessings be unto you. And his and his increase in blessings be unto you. This is Sad Nursi is writing this as a letter. Right? It's not just a treatise. He is writing a letter to um, to people, probably to his students. It may be that because he was put in solitary confinement, he was put away from his uh, students and readers too. So he's writing a letter. Aziz Siddiq Kardeşlerim, my dear voracious brothers, hapis musibetine düşenlere ve onlara merhamet kârane, sadakatle hariçten gelen erzaklarına nezaret ve yardım edenlere 
kuvvetli bir teselliyi üç noktada beyan edeceğim. In three points, I will elucidate a powerful consolation for those who have fallen into the calamity of imprisonment as well as those who compassionately and faithfully supervise their provisions and who assist them. So, there will be three points and they will provide consolation to the uh, prisoners and also to those who are guarding them. But Ustad Nusi does not say who are guarding them. He says who compassionately and faithfully supervise their provisions and assist them. This is the role that he thinks that a prisoner, a prison guard should have. When we approach life, from the perspective of the most merciful, the mercy giving, whose mercy has risen above and surpassed his wrath, whose beauty is manifest all around, whose majesty is manifest in his beauty and whose beauty is manifest in his majesty. When we get there, then we see that life becomes different. Prison guards should not be these like sulky, um, sullen people who are looking over the criminals who at any moment can do something wrong and should be punished. No. They should be compassionately and faithfully supervising the provisions of the prison inmates. They, they are locked up there. They cannot uh, procure their own provisions. And they are locked up there. They need assistance. They should be assisting them. And and apply this to all runs, all aspects of life. Not, I mean, prison is an extreme case. But there are people in need all around. There are people who are less skillful or more skillful. Those who are more skillful should be helping those who are less skillful. There are people who have more opportunities and less opportunities. Those who have more opportunities should be assisting those who have less opportunities. That is how life should be. Life should be an, an example of mutual assistance, mutual reliance, solidarity. Wouldn't life be better if that's, that were the approach that we took about this? Instead of thinking everything as a struggle and a maximization of interest, Again, this is about a paradigm shift. And until we shift that paradigm, we will not be able to build that um, El Dorado, that utopia in this world. And perhaps we will never be able to, but it doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we should not be aspiring toward it. We should be aspiring toward it. The more we aspire toward it, the more we yearn for it, the more we feel that urge to get there and, and, and have it and to behave accordingly in order to have it, the more likely we are to be rewarded with what we desire. Man talaba wajadda wajadda. Whoever demands and is serious about it will find what they are looking for. If you are looking for paradise, perhaps you will not find it in this world but you will find it. The one who gave that desire to you to aspire toward it, to, ask, to, to look for it, to search for it, to seek it, is too merciful not to give what he has given to you the desire of. The one who has filled your heart with that aspiration is too merciful not to give what you aspire for. To you if not in this world then in the hereafter and it's better in the hereafter anyway so let's continue with these points birinci nokta hapiste geçen ömür günleri her bir gün 10 gün kadar bir ibadet kazandırabilir ve fani saatleri meyveleri cihetiyle manen baki saatlere çevirebilir ve 5-10 sene ceza ile Milyonlar sene hapsi ebediden kurtulma vesile olabilir. 
işte ehl iman için bu pek büyük ve çok kıymetli kazanç şartı farz namazını kılmak ve hapse sebebiyet veren günahlardan tövbe etmek ve sabır içinde şükretmektir. Zaten hapis çok günahlara manidir meydan vermiyor. First point. The days of life spent in prison can each cause acquiring 10 days worth of worship. And we already talked about this in the previous episode, in the previous section that we read. Uh, here it is a summary and, and, and perhaps reminder. The days of life spent in prison can each cause acquiring 10 days worth of worship. Why? Because it's a time of difficulty. You are doing it in, under difficulty. And that increases the reward. Plus, you are isolated, insulated from the rest of the world and you do not have way to, to sins which should work on your heart, which should purify your heart. And the measure of the acquisition of rewards from our deeds, actions, is the purity of our heart, our ikhlas, our sincerity. Sincerity is the coefficient by which the rewards of acts and deeds are multiplied. So if one tries to keep one's heart pure, that is something to achieve uh, relatively easily in prison than outside, where the hustle and bustle of life are, is, is distracting us from everything. So first point, the days of life spent in prison can each cause acquiring 10 days worth of worship. It can convert or they can convert temporal hours into metaphysically everlasting hours from the point of view of their fruits and be the cause of being saved from millions of years of eternal imprisonment in return for five to ten years of punishment in this world. So they can convert temporal hours, temporal hours, all hours that we have in this world, right, are temporal, they are passing. There is not a moment that we can capture and freeze. Maybe you can take pictures. But what you are freezing in pictures is the image of those moments, not the moments themselves. So, is there a way to perpetuate these hours, these lives? Yes. There are ways to convert them into everlasting hours. How? Well, the day's life spent in prison is one of the opportunities. You can convert those temporal hours into metaphysically everlasting hours from the view of their fruits. So, from the point of view of their fruits, the hours themselves, perhaps, will pass. There is no way to bring them. But those hours can either yield something while passing or not yield something. You can have a fruit tree and the tree can, if you know, taken well care of, uh, yield their fruits and then you can eat the fruits. Or, Something may happen, let's say a, a frost may happen or a drought may happen. It, it may not receive the kind of attention that it needs and it can abort. It can perhaps bloom, but not fruit. Perhaps it may, it may even not bloom. That is how life, the, the hours of our lives are. They are like fruit trees. They will either bloom and fruit or they will abort. They will abort if we do not use them in the way that God wants us to use them. If we spend them in a state of heedlessness and forgetfulness without knowing our Lord, without worshipping. If we spend them in a state of worship, that is when they fruit. That is when they yield rewards, spiritual rewards as their fruits, as their eternal fruits that we will be eating in paradise. Now, can we keep worshipping all the time? The day has 24 hours. Can we convert all 24 hours into fruits? The answer is yes. How? Again, by intention. By viewpoint and intention. And if this is in the prison, then the very act of being patient, for instance, showing patience in the face of difficulty and calamity, that's worship. If, if it is being done with the right kind of viewpoint and intention. If it is being done with the knowledge of God and gratitude to Him 
and, and showing patience in what he determines for us in this life, having trust in him. But there are conditions, and we will come to the conditions. And B, so the, the days uh, of life spent in prison, <coughs> third, can be the cause of being saved from millions of years of eternal imprisonment, right? That is the big, big danger. Perhaps if this person was not put in prison, he was going to continue committing crimes, killing, stealing, lying, slandering, embezzling, and, and so, on, so on and so forth. Now, all of those earn eternal imprisonment. Now that he or she is put in prison, he is prevented from being able to commit those sins. He is paying for what he has committed, inshallah. We are paying for what he has committed in this world so that uh, it, it will not be left to the hereafter. Or perhaps if there is something left to the hereafter, it will be less. So isn't that a good trait? A good <laughs> exchange? You give five to ten years in punishment in this world, but you are saved from eternal imprisonment. And I mean, the, the affairs of the hereafter are drastic it is beyond our ability to imagine a moment of hell like dipping one's finger into hell may be may be worse than a whole life spent in in a state of in a dungeon in this world the torment of the hell is fearful and the blessings of the paradise blessings of paradise are beautiful and that too is incomparable a moment in paradise an hour in paradise may be much more much worthier than a thousand years of happy life in this world for the people of faith uh, now we have conditions we said right well you have to have faith because if you don't have faith, that means you don't recognize your Lord. That means there is no worship that's going to, to bloom and fruit in your life. You need to recognize the Lord. He is the one to whom your worship is directed. For the people of faith, the condition for this great and very precious gain is praying the obligatory prayers, repenting from the sins that have caused imprisonment and showing gratitude in a state of patience. The prison prevents many sins anyway. It blocks their way. So for the people of faith, first condition, and then, I mean, that's the prerequisite, right? rather. That's the prerequisite. Once you fulfill the prerequisite, then, then, then you can start thinking about conditions. conditions. The condition for this great and very precious gain is praying the obligatory prayers. Why? Why is it so important? Because it is so important. Because that's what God commanded us to do. We cannot claim to be in a state of obedience and worship and not do the first and foremost thing that God has commanded us to do insistently in his holy book that he revealed to his prophet in order to pass on to us. That is what God wants from us first and foremost and we cannot claim to be obeying him, worshiping him while we do not do that, that first and most important thing that he asks from us. The first condition is, is praying the obligatory prayers and then and then repenting from the sins that have caused imprisonment. Right? Do you want your prison uh, experience to be uh, to atone for your sins and save you from the punishment that is due upon those sins in the hereafter, yeah, then, then you need to repent from them. You cannot think highly of your sins and then go to the hereafter and expect to be forgiven for them. You first need to recognize that they are sins, that they are grave, uh, grave transgressions that you have transgressed. You have transgressed the boundaries that your Lord has has has ordained put in place you have to recognize that and then you have to seek his forgiveness you have to seek refuge in him that is what tawbah means you have to turn to him you have you have turned away from him now you have to turn to him and if you turn to him you will find him merciful and gentle and generous 
But if you don't turn to him, you cannot benefit from his blessing and mercy and gentleness and generosity. You are turning your back to him and running away. How, how, do, how do you expect to receive the rains of mercy that are descending if you are running away from that rain? And showing gratitude in a state of patience. Now that's the other thing. If, if, you, if you fall into a state of rebelliousness, then you cannot expect to be accepted, admitted as, as a worshipful slave in his, in his presence. You need to show patience. And more than that, you need to show gratitude. You need to recognize that despite all circumstances, you are still, you are still basking in the sun, in the warmth of the sun of his mercy. You are giving food. You need food, you are given food. You need oxygen, you are given air. You need a, you need not to be swallowed by earth. The earth is given firmness so that it can hold you up. There is nothing that you can achieve to continue your existence, let alone to, to derive pleasure from your existence that you can achieve by yourself. It is all given and there is a giver and that giver is giving all of these things to you out of his mercy, out of his compassion, out of his recognition that you are in need and you are needy and you are poor, you are in poverty, you are, you are impotent. You, the, the more you recognize your impotence and poverty and, and neediness and turn to him with this recognition, with this recognition and with the acknowledgement of your, your state, your situation, then he will turn to you with his mercy. If you take one step toward him, he will take ten steps toward you. If you go to him walking, he will come running to you. But first, you need to turn to him and ask. You need to turn to him and recognize that he is the lord you are his slave and you need to you need to start to enjoy being his slave you need to feel the joy of being his slave and therefore not the slave of anything else including including your vain desires and an evil commanding soul your compulsive soul the prison prevents many sins anyway right you you need to acquire that state Sins are like these black dots that are smeared on your heart, that stain your heart. And the more black dots are on your heart, the more sealed it is. And may God protect us. May God not write that for us, that if that happens and the heart is covered in all black stain, eventually that may mean that our hearts are sealed. May that not be the case for us. May that not be the case for us. But in the prison, there is this blessing that there, are, there, is, there is less opportunity to stain your, your heart. Now, someone who wants to sin will be able to sin anywhere in the prison too. But it is just that it is, there is less distraction, there is less opportunity to sin. And one who recognizes this should focus on that and use it as an opportunity. İkinci nokta. Zevali lezzet elem olduğu gibi zevali, zevali elem dahi lezzettir. Now the second point. As there is pain in the cessation of delight or pleasure. There is delight or pleasure in the cessation of pain. This is a famous quote from Ustad Nursi. From Bedi Uzzaman Said Nursi. Zevali lezzet elem olduğu gibi zevali elem dahi lezzettir. As there is pain in the cessation of delight and pleasure. There is delight and pleasure in the cessation of pain. He will explain, but it's simple. We should just just stop for a moment and think about it. How many pleasurable times were there in the past that we have experienced? And the more pleasure, the better that we, we, we now feel are filled with this nostalgic pain that tells us, if only, if only I could get back there, if only I could experience that again, if only... Oh, those were the days. Those were the days. But you can't. You can't get back there. You can't experience it again. And that feeling of being separated from those pleasurable moments and the things that gave you pleasure and delight at that time, that is painful. And if you think of this at the present moment, if you are going through a pleasurable experience at the present moment, that you know that it too will not last is pain in the pleasure itself unless you have the ability to convert that into eternal everlasting pleasure which is what faith does for us 
right? There is pain in the cessation of delight, but the opposite of this is also true. There is delight in the cessation of pain. If you are going through a trouble, when it comes to an end, you take a deep breath of relief. And if you know as you are going through it that it will come to an end, then that gives you pleasure within the pain itself. It makes it more bearable. And you can look forward to the moment it's going to come to an end and have derived pleasure from that. It's a big secret. That's a big you know, paradigm shift that we should all try to employ in our lives. Evet, herkes geçmiş lezzetli, safalı günlerini düşünse, teessüf ve tahassür elemi manevisini hissedip, eyvah der ve geçmiş musibetli, elemli günlerini tahattur etse, zevalinden bir manevi lezzet hisseder ki, elhamdülillah şükür, o bela sevabını bıraktı gitti der. Yes, whoever thinks of the delightful and joyful days of the past days, says, woe to me. Feeling the metaphysical pains of sadness and longing, right? It's not physical pain. You are not having pain like a, like a cut wound, right? You are not that that's not being transmitted through your nerves to your brain, etc. But you are feeling pain. It's a metaphysical pain somewhere in your soul, in your spirit, in your heart, in your intellect. Whoever thinks of the delightful and joyful days of the past says, "Woe to me." Feeling the metaphysical pains of sadness and longing, longing for those beautiful times. Yet, upon remembering the calamitous and painful days of the past, this person feels a spiritual delight and says, Praise be to God. I am grateful that that trouble departed, leaving its spiritual rewards behind. Leaving its spiritual rewards behind. If you were patient if you were a believer you were patient and you were fulfilling the obligatory acts that god has asked you to fulfill right it has left spiritual rewards behind even for non believers the cessation of pain is going to bring pleasure right but for the believer it is way more than that it will leave spiritual rewards which then become fruits fruits to enjoy in the hereafter. Ferah ile teneffüs eder. Demek bir saat muvakkat elem ruhta bir manevi lezzet bırakır ve lezzetli saat bilakis elem bırakır. So, continuing the same idea, right? He breathed a sigh of relief and joy. The person who went through the difficult times and for whom the pain is now over, breathed a sigh of relief and joy in that case so in that case an hour of temporary pain leaves a metaphysical delight in the spirit while a delightful hour leaves pain now again it's, this is if it is not seen from the right perspective a delightful hour leaves pain if you did not find out the way to perpetuate it madam hakikat budur ve madem geçmiş musibet saatleri, elemleri ile beraber madum ve yok olmuş ve gelecek bela günleri şimdi madum ve yoktur ve yoktan elem yok ve madumdan elem gelmez. Mesela birkaç gün sonra aç ve susuz olmak ihtimalinden bugün o niyetle mütemadiyen ekmek yese ve su içse ne derece divaneliktir. Aynen öyle de geçmiş ve gelecek elemli saatleri ki hiç ve madum ve yok olmuşlar şimdi düşünüp sabırsızlık göstermek ve kusurlu nefsini bırakıp Allah'tan şekva etmek gibi of of demek divaneliktir. Eğer sağa sola yani geçmiş ve geleceklere sabır kuvvetini dağıtmazsa ve hazır saate ve güne karşı tutsa tam kafi gelir. Sıkıntı ondan bire iner. Hatta şekva olmasın ben bu üçüncü medrese Yusufiye'de birkaç gün zarfında hiç ömrümde görmediğim maddi ve manevi sıkıntılı hastalıklı musibetimde Hususan nurun hizmetinden, mahrumiyetimden gelen meyusiyet ve kalbi ve ruhi sıkıntılar beni ezdiği sırada inayet ilahiye bu meskur hakikati gösterdi. Ben de sıkıntılı hastalığımdan ve hapsinden razı oldum. Çünkü benim gibi kabir kapısında bir biçareye gafletle geçebilir bir saatini 10 adet ibadet saatleri yapmak büyük kardır diye düşündüm. Büyük kardır diye şükreyledim. 
Now, since this is the reality, since the past times of calamity are doomed to extinction along with their pains, they have disappeared and the calamitous days of the future are extinct as of now, they do not exist, then there is no pain in that which does not exist and pain does not arise or should not arise from that which is doomed to extinction. Let's read this again. It's a bit complicated. Since this is the reality, what we already went over is the reality. Since the past times of calamity are doomed to extinction along with their pains, they're gone. They have disappeared. They're not here now. Yeah, uh, five years ago, you had a traffic accident and broke your leg and you had to go in a cast for two months and it was painful. But it's gone now. You are not experiencing it any longer. Yeah, you may have the memories of it. But as long as you know how to manage it, those memories are not the same as the existence of the pain. The pain is extinct. The calamity is extinct. It disappeared. Right? Then, the calamitous days of the future are extinct as of now too. They do not exist. Did they come? No, maybe they will not come. Maybe the world will come to an end and what you are looking forward to as a possible calamity will not materialize. Maybe there will be a divine intervention and things will take a different course and it will never come to be. Right? They do not exist. They are as of now, they are extinct. They do not exist. Then, there is no pain in that which does not exist. The calamities of the past, the calamities of the future. They do not exist from your point of view right now. And therefore, there should be no pain in that which does not exist. And pain does not arise from that which is doomed to extinction. For example, how much of a lunacy it is to continually eat bread and drink water because of the possibility of becoming hungry and, and thirsty a few days from now. Right, think about it. Somebody thinks, in three days, I will be hungry and thirsty. Then, let me eat now. Eat this, eat that. Let's force my stomach. Right? There's so much that you can eat. If you push it further, you are going to die out of indigestion before three days of, you know, it comes. If you keep drinking water, too much water can turn into poison for you too. So, that's lunacy, right? Now, there are some animals who can do it. A camel can do it. Because they have space to store it. We don't have space to store it. How much of a lunacy would it be to continually eat bread bread, and drink water because of the possibility of becoming hungry and thirsty a few days from now? Just in the same way, in that way, it is lunacy to think of the painful hours of the past and the future, which are nothing, are doomed to non-existence and have disappeared. The past and the future are nothing. They are doomed to non-existence. They, they are executed. They are gone. They have disappeared. You know, to think about the painful hours of the past and the future and show impatience at the present and say, off, off, as if complaining about God while leaving one's faulty lower soul aside. If you, if you are going to complain, you have to, you need to, you should be complaining about your faulty lower soul, your compulsive soul. If there is any any harm that comes to you, that is from your bad choices. That is the bad choices of your lower soul. And if there is any good that comes to you, that's from God. So if this, while this is the case, how can you leave your lower soul aside and complain of God or about God? Right? It is lunacy to think of the painful hours of the past and the future, which do not exist, and, and, and show impatience at the present and say off off as if complaining about god while leaving one's faulty lower soul aside if the person does not scatter if a person does not scatter his power of patience left and right that is to the past and to the future and uses it for the present hour and day it will completely suffice patience is a blessing from god too and it is given as provision. The way we need food, we need, provi uh, we need uh, patience. And the way food is given to us as provision, patience is given to us as provision. However, if we were to take the food that is provided to us and throw it away, s s 
squander it, scatter it around, instead of perhaps putting in the refrigerator, eating what we need, and then putting in the refrigerator and preserving the rest to eat later when we are hungry again, then we will be wasting that provision and we would not be able to benefit from it. It is the same idea. If a person does not scatter his power of patience left and right, that is, to the past and to the future, to the non-existent problems and pains of the past and to the non-existent problems and pains of the future and uses it for the present hour and day, then that patience will completely suffice. The distress is reduced from 10 to 1. There is one distress at the given moment, but we, we expand it, inflate it, by connecting it to the distresses of the past and the future and one becomes ten. If we stop doing it, ten would become one. So much so that may not be understood as complaint. During my few days at this third madrasa of Yusuf alayhi salam, and Ustad Nursi called prisons Madrasa Yusufiye, maybe we can say like Josephian Madrasa, Madrasa of Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf alayhi salam as as you know well, uh, you know, chose prison over freedom because in freedom he saw sin and destruction and and um, calamity and calumny, right? In freedom he saw his eternal destruction, so he chose prison over the outside, uh, the the world of freedom that's outside, and in prison he matured. He he came. He, he came closer to his Lord. He was blessed. He was blessed with Gnosis of his, his Lord. When he was a prophet, of course, he is above the you know, regular Gnostics. But he was blessed with openings and illumination in prison. God, God taught him in the, in the prison. That is the, why the prison, Ustad Nursi refers to it as a madrasa, a place of study. A place of learning. The prison is a place of learning. During my few days at this third madras of Yusuf, this was the third third time he was detained in prison. At a time of calamity caused by sickness, and this is old age, we should keep in mind. He's only like 60s, 70s. At a time of calamity caused by sickness and my material and metaphysical distress, the like of which I have not seen in my life before especially while the despair and the distresses of the heart and the spirit arising from my being deprived of the service of the light. And Ustad Nursi you know, dedicated himself to the service of the light, which is the Risale in Nur, which is a, an interpretation of the Quran uh, from the point of view of this present time. What does the Quran tell us in this present day? That is that is the Risale Inur. Risale Inur is an instrument for us to see the Quran, like like glasses through which you look and see better, right? It, it is a it is a it is a it is a binocular or a telescope. When we look with it, we see what is in the Quran, and that is most relevant to the times that we live. Right, so Ustad Nursi dedicated his life to this, and he was finding joy in it. He was finding purpose in it. And when he's put in prison, yes, there is sickness, there is the distress, the physical distress, but this is the real distress that is bothering him, right? Especially while the despair and the distresses of the heart, and he's you know, put into solitary confinement. He cannot teach his students. He cannot. Uh, review what was written before. He cannot write new lessons, right? And the spirit, the stresses of the heart and the spirit arising from my being deprived of the service of the light have been crushing me. Divine solicitude showed this aforementioned truth, what we just mentioned. Patience, how do you use patience? In that moment, right? Divine solicitude shows him this is how you need to spend your patience, and if you do so, it will suffice. And I became content with my distressful sickness and imprisonment, because I became grateful that for a helpless person like myself, who waits at the gates of the grave, 
making an hour of his life that can be spent in heedlessness into 10 hours of worship is a great profit. So he's in his 70s by this time. He is looking forward to the grave. It's, it, it appears to be very close. It is close to all of us. But, you know, people who are older obviously feel it more, right? He is looking at the grave and he is thinking, so if I were outside, if I were not in prison, perhaps there will be some comfort and I was going to fall into heedlessness. And we need to take it, you know, with a measure, of course, Ustad Nursi is so dedicated to his cause that there isn't a moment that he, he, he spends without thinking about it. That's why he, he, he cannot marry. For instance, he, he doesn't have the, the space in his mind to pay some attention, to, to give consideration to something like marriage. His entire life is dedicated to his cause, right? So he is looking forward to his grave and he's saying, perhaps if I were outside, I was not going to be serving as it is due. And it, it, how is it due at a time like the one that he lived when the caliphate was abolished, madrasas were closed, Sufi orders were banned, people were being forced to forced into disbelief. What kind of a service is necessary at a time like that when people's people's everlasting life is being doomed? Right? What kind of a service is needed? He's saying, perhaps I was not going to be able to live up to the urgency of the service that is needed at this time. And I was going to spend my hours in heedlessness. But now that I'm in this, in this prison, I'm bound. I'm not free. And if I show patience, I have the opportunity to convert my, a single of, single hour of my life into perhaps 10 hours of worship. Isn't that a prophet? He says that's a prophet and I'm grateful for that. So we are coming to the third point. Üçüncü nokta. And this is the one that's going to be about the prison guards. Üçüncü nokta. Mahpuslara şefkat kârâne hizmetle yardım etmek ve muhtaç oldukları rızıklarını ellerine vermek ve manevi yaralarına tesellilerle merhem sürmekte az bir amel ile büyük bir kazanç var. Ve dışarıdan gelen yemeklerini onlara vermek, aynı o yemek kadar o gardiyan ve gardiyan ile beraber dahilde ve hariçte çalışanların bir sadaka hükmünde defteri hasenatına yazılır. Hususan musibetle de ihtiyar veya hasta veya fakir veya garip olsa o sadakayı maneviyenin sevabı çok ziyadeleşir. Third point. There is significant gain in return for a little deed in assisting the inmates by compassionately serving them, handing the provisions that they need to them, and soothing their metaphysical wounds with consolation. By giving the food that comes to them from outside, the worth of exactly that food is written in the book of deeds of that prison guard, in effect like giving charity as well as of those who work inside and outside the prison. Again, everything is according to intention. If this prison guard does what he is doing, or in some cases she, compassionately, with an intention to serve these people who have received the slap of life and fallen into calamity. Yes, perhaps they were ignorant. Perhaps they were unable to overcome their vain desires and the temptations of their composite souls. Perhaps they were bad and evil, right? But but now, now they're in prison. Now they are poor. Now they are bound. Now they are not free. Now they are in a state of need. So if the prison guard does what he is doing, compassionately with an intention to serve these needy people then even the act of you know taking food that comes from outside perhaps it was cooked outside and was delivered to the uh, prison and delivering it to the inmates 
or perhaps a, an acquaintance relative of a prisoner brings something to, to the prisoner and delivering it again with compassion and with the intention to serve them with the intention to make it easier for them right that becomes like giving charity not only for the prison guard but for all people who are involved in this whole thing inside and outside the prison especially especially if the calamity stricken person is old so not all prison inmates are you know 25 year old bodybuilders when people are put in there sometimes they stay for a long time or sometimes people commit things commit crimes at different ages sometimes they are children sometimes they are elderly especially if the calamity stricken person is old or sick or poor or a stranger the spiritual reward of this metaphysical charity increases by a lot now the thing is again this does not have to be about prison and prison guards alone there are poor sick old people there are strangers around us or around all of us if we were to approach them compassionately with the intention to serve them with the intention to make things easier for them then whatever we did would become charity we turn it would turn into spiritual rewards the spiritual reward of this metaphysical charity increases increases by a lot işte bu kıymetli kazancın şartı farz, farz namazını kılmaktır. Now, this also is a condition and that is the condition for this precious gain is praying the obligatory prayers. Ta ki o hizmeti lillah için olsun. Hem bir şartı da sadakat ve şefkat ve sevinç ile ve minnet etmemek tarzda yardımlarına koşmaktır. So that that service is for God, God alone. So compassion is you are serving and you have compassion good but compassion is a blessing from God too he gave it to you it is an instinct an emotion that he put into you serving requires your uh you know physical abilities intellectual abilities again that's a blessing you have to now use them in the right way they also come with a responsibility how are you going to use your service ability to serve and how are you going to use your compassion will you put it in the right place will you put it in the right place with the right intention what is the right intention well he is the one who gave it to you why did he create you so that you you worship him to worship him you need to use it in his way in the way that he wants for him Lillah, Lillah, for God. So that the service is for God. And another condition is rushing to their assistance faithfully, compassionately and cheerfully in such a way as to not make them feel obliged. So faithfully, faithful to your duty. Right? Faithful to uh, your your solidarity in humanity or in belief and compassionately right we already talked about that and cheerfully if you do it but you are sulking and you are implying that you know i don't want to be here but i have to be here because you committed that crime etc etc then that's going to put put them in a situation where where they will feel obliged so rushing to their assistance faithfully compassionately and cheerfully in such a way as to not make them feel obliged Um, the same discussion continues in the following episode, episode too. It's also going to be about um, prison, but it is uh, lengthier than we can finish in the remaining minutes. So, inshallah, we will continue. I'm hoping that we will be able to finish the prison part uh, next uh, in the next episode and then move on to other Uh, discussions it is i think useful to remind ourselves once again that this is about changing the paradigm shifting the paradigm and seeing things from a perspective that that enables us to benefit from the wisdom of the quran 
and that has repercussions, manifestations in all aspects of life. One is, you know, if you are young, how do you make use of your youth? Another is, if you are in the prison, how do you make use of uh, your time in prison and turn it into something good for you? Uh, it can be sickness, and we did a whole treatise on sickness, right? Treatise for the sixth, right? When you see things from the right perspective, everything becomes beautiful and everything turns into an opportunity to earn, acquire everlasting happiness and the contentment of your Lord. And may, may, we, may we be able to build that perspective, inshallah. It is not easy uh, because the world pulls us in many directions and makes us forget. The compulsive soul does not think about God and its its ultimate situation. And Satan keeps trying to distract and misguide us. And in the face of all these um, pulls in the wrong direction, we need to be able to maintain our stability. And that is possible by seeing reality as reality is, which is the perspective that the Quran provides, right? But seeing reality as reality is requires struggle against these pulls in the wrong direction. As we look, Satan will try to put glasses in front of our eyes that will show things in, in the distorted ways. We need to we need to Always, first of all, have faith in that reality is beautiful. We need to have faith in that as um, Shaykh Abdul Hakim Murad says, history is in good hands. And that can be global history, history of a people, and our individual histories, our fates, are in good hands. He is the one who is in charge. We are in his charge. Once we once we put that down, once we settle to that and internalize that idea, the rest comes relatively easily. Because now if something appears to be wrong, if something appears to be, you know, false or evil, or something. If, if something appears not to be beautiful, because reality is beautiful, then we say, okay, there's something that I'm misperceiving here. I need to work on this. What is the good that I can see in this? And Ustad Nursi says, Güzel bakan güzel görür, güzel gören güzel düşünür, güzel düşünen hayattan zevk ve lezzet, lezzet alır. One who looks or beholds beautifully, sees beautifully, one who sees beautifully, thinks beautifully, processes what he sees beautifully, and one who thinks in a beautiful way derives pleasure and delight from life. May we get there, may we acquire it. May we acquire it, inshallah. Subhanaka. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana. Innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. وآخر الدعوة من الحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة صلوات الله